Welcome to New Watermark Photography Podcast, an international offering of Sin Marca de Agua, a podcast for professionals and enthusiasts to connect and share their stories. I'm Jessica Duque, food photographer and your host. This podcast is brought to you by Sigma, sigmabenelux.com Soho, Brand Studio whitebackdrops.com Anna Brand is a published author, educator, podcaster, YouTuber, brand ambassador, and owner of her own personal brand as a result of a very successful trajectory as one of the most recognized maternity and newborn photographers in the world since 1999. She has worked with celebrities such as Alicia Silverstone, Ian Seary, Kobe Bryant, and many others. Anna Brandt is an international educator and founder of BellyBabySchool.com, where she teaches photography online, and she has given on-site training in over 32 countries around the world, in addition to running her own busy photography studio in Dustin, California. Anna is a profit ambassador a certified photographic craftsman with Professional Photographers of America, and she has taught on the worldwide platform Creative Life. Anna has self-published two books on maternity and newborn photography, which can be found at thecreativenewborn.com. Host of the podcast related to pregnancy and newborn photography, marketing, and motherhood. Designer and founder of BaileyBabyWear.com, an online store that sells to over 80 countries. Anna was one of the first designers in the world to design maternity gowns for the prop market. This is No Watermark Photography Podcast. Welcome, Anna Brandt, maternity and newborn celebrity photographer. Welcome, Anna Brandt. She's a, like, a really well-known uh, photographer and newborn and maternity. I'm so happy to have you here. And I have a, a lot of questions regarding to uh, newborn photography. How did everything start? Because uh, how do you end up as a newborn photographer? I understand uh, your background is uh, into uh, IT and technology. You know, I have, I mean, I started as a teenager just being an amateur photographer. Okay. Uh, my good family, my dad is from Argentina. He um, was born in Buenos Aires, Argentina, and he's bilingual. And he came to the United States and in Brooklyn, New York, and met my mother, mm -hmm. and brought him to the States, and then friends brought him to dinner and met my mother, and so she was Norwegian, so he was Hispanic, and she was white American, and years ago, that was very taboo for them to date, and they were together forever. My mom passed away in October. We were together since they were, she was 25 years of age and she passed away at 86. So a very long time. Well, when um, they adopted me, uh, my dad would take a lot of photos in the family to send to Argentina for his family mm -hmm. because all of his family was in Argentina. He was the only one in the States. Okay. So taking photos was a very big part of our family. Um, and so I just started taking photos like everybody else was taking photos not even really thinking of it my dad always had a camera mm -hmm. and I ended up going to a boarding private school in New Jersey because I lived in New York and when I got there we would just take photos because we were away from our families and we would just take a lot of photos and then um, I'm the youngest of five in my adopted family so my oldest two brothers both married after college and both had kids pretty quickly. So I had two nieces and two nephews. Okay. Of those four, two of my nieces are married now. One of my nephews is engaged and one of them just had a baby. So now they're all adults. Um, and I was fascinated with, I always loved babies. I worked in a church nursery at 12. I babysat very young, 12, 13. And I loved babies. I think being the youngest of five, there was no one younger than me. So babies were always my thing. So from babysitting to the church nursery, and then when my nieces and nephews were born, mm -hmm. I was in love. Like, oh, I just love babies. So I would just want to take photos of them. 
just because I would take photos and I love babies. That was it. There was no intention to be a photographer. I never said, oh, I want to be a photographer. I love babies. I loved photography. And in school, I went to school and majored in accounting. They had dark room. And I was like, oh, I could develop my own film. I should take a class and learn how to do that. Why not? Mm -hmm. And I did. And my life for 10 years as an amateur was just that. It was not me wanting to become pro. It wasn't me wishing one day. I never had that conversation with myself. It was go to school, work. I became a web developer. I always worked a lot. Always would have three to four jobs. Always. That was my thing since I was 18 years of age. I've been a nanny. I've been a bank teller. I've been a web designer. I've been a waitress. I've been a key punch operator. I've worked in investment firms. I've worked for accounting. Like I just would always work. And through all my 20s, I would work and date and travel and would take photos just like anybody else. And then uh, one day at 29, um, I had was engaged and relocated to California. We got married and I was working as a web designer and my company relocated us and my husband was in the tech world. And I started, you know, just taking photos because he traveled all the time. So I was very much by myself. So I would go to the beach and take photos. And I would take photos of flowers and I would just take photos. Mm-hmm. And then I received something in the mail that was about child modeling agency. And in the back, I saw there were all these ads for photographers. And so I was like, oh, I should place an ad. I had a website because I was a web designer. So I had a website since I was like 23. And I called the company and said, how much was it to place an ad? And they said it was $25. Okay. And I want to place an ad. And they said, oh, well, we're looking for photographers to photograph child models. Do you want to bring in your portfolio? Mm -hmm. Sure. My portfolio consisted of my nieces, my nephews, that was it. All that I had just developed in the darkroom, all just people, brought my portfolio to them. They said, we love your work. Why don't you leave your cards with us? And when we sign in model, they will look at the different photographers that we recommend and they'll choose you. So I started shooting child models on the side, still kept my day job. Mm -hmm. Again, not planning on quitting, not planning on going pro, just the only way I can explain that time in my life is I loved photography. I loved children and I loved babies. That was it. I didn't have any other intention but that. And uh, one day I told my boss, I think I was going to work at home that weekend. It was a holiday weekend. And He was like, well, I don't know if we want you to work from home. And I was like, well, I I have a contract. I can work from home if I want. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, we like having you in the office. And I said, who cares? And then I quit. I said, you know, I've been working 10 straight years. Put myself through college and always was a worker. Rarely took more than like a week or two off at a time. And I said, I just wanted to quit working for corporate and see what happens. Again, I didn't say at that time, I want to be a professional photographer. I want people to know who I am. I want to make lots of money. Those things never, ever left my mouth. The only thing that I said was, I think I just want to leave corporate and just see what I do. And I remember I kind of cried that weekend, like letting go of my career and that I had worked so hard on and I never looked back, registered my business. My dad's an accountant. So I, I already had formed a company. I had side businesses that I sold. I had built a web business. I ended up selling that. I used to hand color photographs. The company that I used to buy the oils from bought the company from me. So I sold two companies by the time I was 29 and left my day job and registered my business and never looked back and that's the whole story it's amazing because i I feel related to to your story and i was listening today one of your episodes of your podcast and then you said something that that is like i felt really like related Uh, sometimes you have days 
that you doubt yourself. Like, should I continue doing this? <laughs> like, you have good days, but bad days, and 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 sometimes you wonder, like, okay, well, I wonder if I made a mistake, like quitting my corporate job as well, and some, and then I said, yeah, it's just a bad day, and I'll continue, and you know, like pursuing my dream to be one of the best food photographers, and and that is so so nice. And how 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 is your story in the end? But by the way, do you speak Spanish? Uh, yes and no. I yes. can. Um, I can understand way more than I'll speak. Mm-hmm. Um, but my English is way, way better than my Spanish. And so it's just so intimidating for me because there's so many different dialects. You know, I was mm-hmm. raised with a father from Argentina and then I come to California and most people are Mexican. I'm Puerto Rican. Mm-hmm. And so I do not speak it fluently. And Like I travel to Puerto Rico. And so when I go there, I can get by, I can talk to them because they expect me to, to speak their language. Or they, I've been in places where they wouldn't even speak to me in English. Um, but I, I prefer not to because I'm not as comfortable in it. But I, I can understand a lot of Spanish. That's really cool. That's really cool. I wish I, wish I was fluent in Spanish. Trust me. Well. <laughs> I make my life so much easier. <laughs> I understand. I, I love my language. Spanish is like, uh, you know, so romantic in the end, how we express ourselves. So yeah, English is really handy. English is really handy, but uh, Spanish is romantic. Okay. Could you please guide us through uh, from the moment that a new mom uh, books a session with you? How is everything? So because of price range and the experience, everything. So You know, I, for so many years, would have kind of a session-only price as well as a digital price. And this past year, I got rid of the session-only price. So now I have digital packages that I'm very comfortable with. And I have a wide range of packages that can cater to a wide range of clientele. I have everyday clientele and I have celebrity clientele. I... You know, with with me, I'm somebody who I like to prepare the client. So I have a, a prep guide that I've written that, you know, my client sees and I explain to them that I want them to arrive with a hungry baby. I want them to arrive um, relaxed, ready mm-hmm. to be the baby in my environment. I think it's very important that the baby has a feeding in the environment that we're going to be. Um, I do sessions early in the morning. So I never will book a newborn past 10.30. So usually it's 8 or 8.30, 10 or 10.30, unless it's an older baby or a premature baby, maybe 11, but nobody is booked past that. Mm-hmm. So newborns are only in the morning. And I prefer a super early morning, like 8, 8.30. And in the beginning, my clients will be like, oh, that's that's so early. Um, and I say, yes, but you will be out early, you'll be out before lunch, and the baby will sleep amazingly well. So when the parents arrive, um, I usually ask when they last fed the baby, and they'll say, oh, let's say it's an 8.30 session. They'll say 5.30, 6 a.m., and I'll say, perfect. I want you to just enjoy my studio. The studio is clean. I didn't take anything out. My camera is not even burning. So if every time a newborn client walks in my studio, nothing has been touched. It is super clean because mm-hmm. my Things. Um, and my camera's not loaded there's no staff in the room so we bring them in we let them know that we want them to undress baby down to the diaper and wake the baby up a little bit if the baby's asleep mm-hmm. and food baby and we want them to just relax they can show me images of inspiration they can pick outfits uh, they can tell me props so sometimes they'll come in with a lot of images that you know they want to show me And then they usually say, oh, but, you know, you can choose. And I'll say, well, I, I want you, I want to get an idea of your style and what you like. So show me images that you like. Let's pick out some outfits. And then I'm going to leave you. So I leave them alone in the room in the space to just be present. They feed the baby. We have coffee, tea, snacks. And they let me know when they're done feeding the baby. So then my assistant will come and get me. Mm-hmm. When the baby's fed, they show me the outfits they've picked. Usually my assistant will work with them and pick some outfits, and I'll kind of get an idea of their colors, their styles, 
we'll discuss what's the most important thing. If there's a toddler, do we start with the toddler, give the toddler some time to warm up. Sometimes clients come and get hair and makeup done. Um, like tomorrow, I have an 8.30 client. They're coming at 7.30 with my makeup artist. They'll be here mm-hmm. before I even arrive to get their hair and makeup done. Just sometimes that happens. And my hair and makeup will meet them before me and just do their hair and makeup. So not always, but sometimes that happens. And so then when we're ready to go, I tell them I'm going to start with baby. I'm going to dress baby and help with first, keep the diaper on, and then wrap baby. And mm-hmm. I do this every session because it allows the baby to be comfortable that first set is whenever i'm teaching i tell people it's the comfort set it's not i'm the best photographer in the world it's not i'm amazing i'm still working on this i need the parents to relax i need the baby to relax i need the energy in the room to be relaxed so we're going to keep the diaper on because the baby just ate we're going to go to the bathroom i'm going to put an outfit on but then i'm going to wrap over the outfit by doing this i can get the baby nice and content and comfortable Mm -hmm. and once they're content or asleep i take the wrap off and the outfit is there and then it's just done wow (laughs) sounds like a lot of work and 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 that is a that is correct what you said about the energy of the of the room it has it has to be like you know like quiet and everything because I know from my experience as a mom, if you are stressed, the baby immediately is stressed out, like completely. And about uh, everything that you need to have or need to know, what kind of training is necessary for newborn photography? We had in the past uh, a guest in the Spanish uh, podcast, Jenny Valero. He he was like into learning uh, newborn photography, but he was afraid to, you know, break the baby let's call it like that and it's necessary to learn about this kind of photography yeah you know the it's it's interesting when people say that they're afraid to break the baby because i don't know if i ever had that feeling for me personally mainly because i was very comfortable working with babies and children because remember i had been babysitting i had been to the nursery i had been a nanny and so The interesting thing is, for me personally, Mm -hmm. I was more nervous about the lighting and the setup and the technique and my camera, not the baby. Okay. So, you know, I have two types of photographers. I have the photographers that are very comfortable with babies and they need to learn the the technical. And then I have people that are very uh, technical and need to understand how to hold the baby, right? Yes. Uh, Some have neither, some have both. Uh, you know, babies are a little bit stronger and more resilient than we think, right? Mm-hmm. You need to understand how to hold the baby, how to support the head, how to care for them, how to wrap them. And so I think that in-person training is very important. I mean, when I started, there was no in-person training. I mean, I say all the time, had Anne Geddes, who was around when I started, had in-person training, I would have been her first student. But nobody was training. So I had to just figure it out myself. Now it's different because you can really go anywhere to get training. And so to me, I suggest that people take an in-person workshop. And a lot of people are nervous to take in-person workshops because they say, well, I don't know anything and I'm going to look stupid and I'm not going to, I don't know how to use my camera and I don't know how to wrap the baby. And and I say, that's exactly why you should take in-person training. I would much rather have somebody come into my workshops mm-hmm. than know absolutely nothing and be open and willing to learn and hear what I have to say than people that are so experienced who think they know everything. So I, I tell my students all the time, it's not about what they know, it's about what I know. I'm here to train you and to teach you and to go over the safety and the handling of the baby. Uh, so I think that now, in, you know, we're in the year 2022, I think that there's no reason to not get in person. I wish that people would do that first. Mm-hmm. Many times they go and they buy expensive cameras, they buy expensive camera bags and outfits and wraps, and they, they buy a lot of things that they don't need, they mm-hmm. buy a lot of things that are unnecessary. So I think it would be so much better if, if they have nothing put their camera, take an in-person workshop because then they can leave and understand 
what is it they need? You know, I've written two books, a book on maternity and paternity and on newborn photography. So I tell people, get my book, read it. I have all the supplies, the information, how I started. You know, there's, there is a blueprint. There's a lot of information I teach online as well. So I think, you know, learn online, pick up some books, take an in-person training, work with an assistant and just little by little, just learn. I think it's really necessary the, that the part of the assistant, because uh, working just by yourself, doing everything is a lot of work. And yeah, an assistant can be really, really handy. Okay, Anna, do you have a, a training coming up and like uh, online or um, so many on site? I have both, always. No, no, I mean, so but at the moment, do you have any dates available that you would like to promote and, and mention? I mean, I literally have like 25. <laughs> you go to annabrandeducation.com that's where my in-person workshop is yes. I'm training in california indonesia uh japan india uh new york pennsylvania texas florida all over the place yes uh so you can see the in-person workshops there online i have bellybabyschool.com and we're constantly always adding new courses there as well. Yes. And then I have a membership site where we do live training every month. Last night, I did a live maternity training for two hours for my members. That's at members at Annabrad. So every month, we try to do a live newborn training and a live maternity training. So I always have online and in person. Okay. Um I'm going to leave all the information in the description box of the episode where you can find Anna and all the trainings, everything, and the books, everything. Okay. Um, who are your mentors and or the people you follow closely for inspiration? You know, I, I, I can't say that I can name anybody in particular because I, I don't really have any mentors. Okay. Uh, when I started, there there were really nobody before me. I mean, as I mentioned, Anne Geddes was, you know, in the forefront of the industry. She was not offering training, of course, mm -hmm. and there was nobody training. By the time I wanted to take training, I had already had more experience than everybody training. Mm -hmm. um, so I can't really say that I have particular mentors or people that are above me that I go to okay. I will say with that being said I have a very supportive and amazing staff and team that I will go to for advice and ideas you know Alex my videographer has been working with me we're going on 11 years together and many times if I want to do a, a particular project or I want to experiment with new lighting or new techniques uh, we'll kind of bounce it around with the staff and try new things. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that surrounding yourself with a good team and with creatives, I have a lot of different creative friends in the industry where I just may kind of bounce off ideas or say, this is what I think I'm going to do. I want to try this. I think it's super important to bring in muses, people that are comfortable in front of your camera that allow you to experiment. You know, mm -hmm. all three of my children are 17, 19, 21 now. They're all very comfortable in front of the camera, using the camera. They all do photography. They all do videography. And many times I'll even say to my daughters, like, I want to experiment with this. And I want to go in this location. I want to go shoot at the desert in Dubai. Or I want to go to this. Mm -hmm. and, and I can call upon friends in the industry. I can call upon my kids and say, let's go and try and experiment. I'm constantly trying to learn myself i'll get on youtube and just watch a bunch of videos i'll look at magazines i'll look at billboards i'm inspired by movies i love cinematography and i love good photography i love when i if there's an award show and there's an awards photographer taking pictures of the award I, I love things like that so you know for me inspiration is everywhere i go i could pick up a magazine and see a beautiful dress and think oh i wonder what that would look like if it was on a pregnant woman and go to my seamstresses and say, we should make a dress like this, but for pregnancy. Or, you know, it could be a, a color that inspires me to, to do something for newborn or going into a flower shop and buying new flowers. I mean, it's 
I believe that we have to personally inspire ourselves. I can't name any particular photographer that I that I follow because I follow thousands of photographers mm -hmm. around the world. There's so many amazing photographers everywhere that pop up in my feed everywhere. It all inspires me. Yeah, and it's also valid what you said. You can find inspiration in maybe flowers or something that you see in a movie or maybe a song. So it is not necessary to, you know, find inspiration in one person or on, a, on a particular photographer. So now, normally, how long are your sessions? Because you said uh, you start probably at 8.30 in the morning. And how many hours? About two hours. Two hours. I'm wrapping it up by 10.30. Oh, okay, that's good. And what about the age of the baby that you prefer to work with? Because I know now, because of my two kids, the first one was like a little bit more like quiet. And the second, uh, he was like super awake and so, uh, you know, aware, aware of everything that was happening. And for me, it was so difficult to make him some pictures. Some uh, photographer says, uh, yeah, if the baby is like two weeks, older than two weeks, It is more difficult, but what are your recommendations? You know, ideally, we try to book the client within two weeks, but I base it upon the weight of the baby. You know, the other day I had a premature baby who was born in January. Mm -hmm. and so, you know, the baby uh, adjusted age was about a month and a half, still a newborn size. And with that particular baby, the baby would, anytime I changed the baby, the baby would wake up. So I would have a routine. I would change the baby, wrap the baby, the baby would fall asleep. I would get the baby awake, get the baby asleep, unwrap, they have their outfit, repeat. And for that particular baby, because the baby was technically about six weeks adjusted, um, three and a half you know, months birth. I, I had to have a special technique for handling this baby. And it was actually a very successful session. Most of the times when we're pre-booking our clients, we're booking them anywhere from 10 to 14 days from the due date. So then when the client is, the baby is born, we ask the clients to let us know within 24 to 48 hours that they've had the baby and the weight of the baby. The weight of the baby is very important. So if the baby is about nine pounds, I'm going to want that baby maybe more seven to 10 days because I know that a nine to 10 pound baby at two, three weeks is a 12 pound baby. So I'm going to want that baby sooner than later. If the mom says maybe it was only five or six pounds, I'm going to say, I want that baby to gain a little bit more weight and possibly book that baby more around the two week mark. Uh, because I want to make sure that they're eating, that they're digesting, um, because mm -hmm. if you bring in too young of a baby and they're underweight and they're not feeding properly, they're going to just end up cluster feeding the whole session and it's going to be disaster. So weight is important. Uh, we also let clients know, did everything go according to the birth plan? Tell me, do they have NICU time? Do they have jaundice? You know, sometimes parents say, oh, they're a little bit jaundiced. They have to go under the lamps and We, say, we may say, okay, let's let's wait a little bit. Let's wait a solid two weeks and make sure that that baby's been under the lamps and that their, their numbers are good and everything's good. So I don't quickly rush babies. I've had babies at three days. I've had babies at six weeks. Ideally, um, 10 to 14 days is probably my favorite time for average mm -hmm. baby. Do they come to the studio or do you go... Uh... To their places how, how how does it work exactly they do come to the studio now i no longer do home sessions so <laughs> i did home sessions my whole career right before covid 19 yes. i had my last home session i had ironically made a decision to not offer home sessions anymore this was before covid i didn't know covid was happening But I just didn't have time anymore. And I have clients from here to, you know, Beverly Hills. And mm -hmm. I couldn't really take the time. As it is, I already travel to teach. And I have traveled on commission shoots as well, where people will pay me to travel to photograph their baby. But I, I can't do that every day. It's just impossible for me to, there's just not enough hours in the day. So I made a decision that I would no longer be offering home sessions. That I only offer them in my studio, with the exception of 
celebrity sessions are quite often in the home, mm -hmm. uh, as well as uh, if I'm training with the home. Nice. And how many sessions do you uh, do you manage a day? How is a how is a workflow for a yeah. newborn photographer? In this case, your workflow. Okay. On the, the week, you know, I take off Sundays and Mondays. So my studio is closed uh, Sundays and Mondays, and the only time I would be working during those times is if I'm traveling. Um, so my work week is Tuesday through Friday. So most of the time, I'll have at least a newborn every single morning, sometimes twice a day. So when it's really busy, there are times where I could do back to back newborns, do it two a day, I could do anywhere from eight to 10 a week. And there's times where maybe I'm only doing four a week. Last year during the holidays, I was so busy with newborns and family and children. Mm -hmm. And we had tree farm that I was picking up my camera in the morning and putting it down at six o'clock at night. But again, that's only a four day work week. So I do not take shoots on Sundays and Mondays. Um, and Saturdays, I only do one or two Saturdays a month. And they're usually booked a couple of months in advance because right now most of my travel is on the weekends. Mm -hmm. And so I probably only see clients maybe once a month on a Saturday. And so usually I would be done by three or four in the afternoon unless it's the holidays and that I'm working at night. So when it's not holiday, I'm technically could be done shooting by three in the afternoon because I'll do one or two newborns in the morning and then after lunch. I can do pregnancy, I can do one year milestone sessions. I could do anywhere from four to six sessions a day, or I could just have one session a day. So wow. there could be some weeks where I could have 18 in a week, and there are some weeks where I will only have four or five. Wow. And just like a regular <laughs> sorry, just like a regular session, how many photos uh, can you make of uh, one session? Well, I love to shoot. So if the baby's doing really well in a newborn shoot, I can easily shoot 200 frames easily. Um, okay. If it's a family, if it's maybe a baby only, maybe 80 to 100. Uh, parents will see a good range. They'll see anywhere from 40 to 80 images. Uh, but it just depends. Am I doing family? Am I doing baby only? Is it doing sibling? Is it the holidays? Um, I, I am a very fast shooter and my clients will never see more than one of the same pose. So I don't ever shoot. Mm -hmm. And I'm not one of those people that will show them the same pose over and over again. So when I'm in the calling process, I'm going to narrow it down so they're only seeing one picture of every pose. And in a typical family gallery, it could be easily 80 to 100 photos. And the post-production will take you around how many hours do you do it or do you hire oh, someone gosh. to do it? Both. So I do all of the culling process. So when I'm going from card to client, meaning I'm downloading the card, uh, starting it, filing it, culling the session and preparing it for the client for viewing, I do all of that for every single client. Then the client sees their gallery. We used to do in-person sales my whole career. And then once COVID hit, we went to online but now I'm digital packages. So they can buy prints and products and canvases and books, but everybody gets a private online gallery. So they'll see an online gallery anywhere from three to five days from their session. And then once they go through that and they pick their images, depending upon whatever package they have, then the editing process, I have an editor who helps me from there. Prior to that, anything you see on social media or any sneaks, those are all done by me. Uh, that's very important so I can understand the style that I want to do of that session and make sure my editor knows. When the client's picking, then I have an editor who really is only responsible for general cleanup. So that means background fill, if there's a hand in the way, a foot in the way. Then the editor sends the images back to me. Mm -hmm. And I'm the only one that would handle any slimming, any color adjustment any kind of final tonal adjustments. So I look and handle every single image before it goes to the client. That sounds really, really cool. How to how you handle your uh, your process is amazing to to count oh. on on that you do your magic, your colors, your tones. So I'm looking for 98% accuracy out of my camera. So if yes. you see the images from my camera, and many times I'm showing the clients during the session, I'm showing them the images. It looks really good. 
I'm controlling my Kelvin color temperature. I'm controlling my light. I'm perfecting the poses. So there's not a lot of mess to clean up. So whenever I'm talking to photographers and they say, oh, the editing is killing me, unless it's composite, I'm asking them, why is it killing you? Because you should be able to get 98% accuracy out of your camera, your tonal adjustments, the lighting, the color, that should be pretty accurate. Now, if you have a baby with acne or a mom with stretch marks, that's kind of the exception to the rule. And then my rule to myself is, if it's going to take me longer than five minutes to clean up the stretch marks of the acne, I'm going to send it out and have that part done. Mm -hmm. And then I can go back and handle the total adjustments. But I think that if you can handle as much as you can in the camera, and then you can outsource just kind of the mundane skin cleanup that you don't really necessarily need to be doing. I don't need to be you know, I've been doing this 22 years. I don't have the time or the luxury to sit and go for every single stray hair. So I'm going to have somebody that helps me do that. Amazing. The, the, those are goals, definitely, for a photographer. Can you name some mistakes when you're starting out as a, new, uh, as a newborn photographer? And what is your experience or your personal experience with these mistakes that you can, you know, share with us? Oh, yeah, so many mistakes. I've made so many mistakes over the years. I'll probably still make more mistakes in my career. I mean, some of the mistakes early on in my career were not taking a deposit in the beginning of the session. Uh, and then you would have a no show, you know, someone doesn't show up and you call them and they're like, oh, I forgot or my kid is sick. And if they don't have anything invested and they haven't put any money down, they're maybe not going to be so inclined to show up or not be so inclined to call you because there's nothing invested in it. So I do take deposits for all of my sessions. If there's no deposit, there's no booking. And so I think that is very important. It's a must, you know, whether you're doing a hotel, whether you're getting a car, you know, all of these things, reservations and deposits are kind of a part of our society. So I think that is super important. Number one, number two would be contracts you know, having contracts and policies in writing. You know, I remember in the beginning, I didn't really do contracts. And then I remember, I think my first contracts were, I bought templates from PPA. And it was, you know, the best thing I ever did to have them sign it so that, you know, you're not doing reshoots because in the beginning, you're questioning your own work and you're thinking, oh, that was terrible. And I would sabotage my own sessions. I would tell the client it was terrible before they even looked at the photos. So they would come in and they'd look at the photos. And before I even let them look at one picture, I would tell them everything I thought I did wrong and, and when were they available to do a reshoot. <laughs> and then as I hired staff and I hired an assistant, my assistant would tell me, okay, Anna, you're not allowed in the room during the ordering appointment because you're going to sabotage yourself. So my assistant would say, I'm going to do the ordering appointment. I'm going to sit down with it. I'm going to go over the session and you're not going to come in. And then the client would leave and she would hand me their order and she would be like, there we go, done. And I would be like, oh, but it, it was a terrible session and I could have did this, 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 and this. And my sister would say they loved it and they bought photos and that's it. And you keep perfecting your work and understand that not every shoot is meant to be reshot and, you know, every, not everything will go perfect. So, you know, not putting yourself down, not sabotaging yourself, not... It's like questioning your self-worth. If you have a bad session, people will be like, you know, I must be terrible. I should quit. I, I, you know, the baby cries the whole time. And, you know, I quote all the time, Reverend T.D. Jakes, who says, never make a permanent decision on a temporary situation. That's temporary. You had a camera malfunction, temporary. You didn't make any money today, temporary. The baby cried, temporary. So don't, don't be so quick to quit. Don't be so quick to judge yourself. Don't be so quick to say, oh, I should choose another career. And, and make these drastic decisions or go in social media and, you know, bad mark your client. These are all temporary situations, you know, our, even the way we feel about ourselves or our weight or, or, or our emotion, these are all temporary. These, these aren't permanent things. And so having uh, control of your life, having control of your emotions, your behavior, how you speak to your client, how you behave, your professionalism, all of those things should be groomed and perfected in time. And understand that it's a process and you'll learn to grow and perfect your art along the way. 
this is so beautiful what you just said, especially the part that, that you, you're supposed to get a retainer of every photo shoot. So that is the, the most important part because I learned how to do that. And yeah, like you said, sometimes uh, you schedule that, that, that time for that client and didn't show up and it's money that you are not getting if you don't have a retainer. And it's time like, okay, that maybe you said to other client, uh, no, because I'm busy for this client. So this is really, really wise. I love it. Okay, do's and don'ts regarding to the safety to get the newborns uh, to pose. Because I saw um, like a year ago, uh, a, a very dramatic video of a vlogger saying like, these poses are really dangerous for the baby, these, these and that, but you are the expert. <laughs> you know, you never want to force a baby into a pose. I believe in baby-led posing, which means that whatever you're doing, you should definitely work with your hands to feel the comfort of the baby. You should never force a baby to the end of a particular position, meaning if you're turning the head, a slight turn this way or that way, but never have the head extend all the way to the shoulder. That's the end of a position, right? So you want to make sure that it's gentle movements, that you're not forcing their head or their limbs or their arms in a position that is not comfortable for them. And if a baby doesn't want to do something in particular, don't do it. You know, even basic poses like baby on their belly and a beanbag. Sometimes if you have a very gassy baby and they're just not comfortable on their tummy and they just Every time you put them on their tummy, they just start screaming bloody murder. You're like, maybe mm -hmm. I shouldn't do this pose. You know, I do work on a yoga ball. So I have a yoga ball in every single session and I wear socks with treading in the bottom. I've never fallen off of a yoga ball. And so I think that, you know, you shouldn't work bare feet because you want clean feet. So wear socks with no slip on the bottom so you don't slip. Make sure that your handling is very gentle, never forceful. As far as what paid, uh, poses are good or not good for a baby, it's uh, I'm not a doctor, so I, I can't give a professional opinion. Some people love the froggy, some people hate the froggy, some people love the taco, some people hate the taco. I, you know, do the froggy position in a way that I make sure that I feel that I'm not injuring or hurting the baby. And if the baby doesn't want to do it or they're fussing or they're crying, I, I don't do it. And I think the biggest advice I can give you is you need to be able to hold a baby, handle a baby and position the baby in your hands. Because if you do that, you can feel the baby. You can feel if they're comfortable. You can feel if their their tummy is gassy and you don't, you don't want to force a position where their stomach is going to hurt. Um, and again, if you're hopefully being trained by the right person, um, hopefully you're being trained in the safety of the baby. Never leave a baby unattended. So you don't wanna you know, put the baby in the bucket and walk away because if that baby leaps out of the bucket, they could fall. You know, The head is much heavier than the body. And so that's why having a spotter is so important, making sure their breathing is, is correct. If they're laying on their belly, making sure that their hands are not tucking under their neck, restricting their airways. Just like if they're on their back, you wanna make sure that their airways are, are you know, clear. You know, even if I touch my chin to my chest, if I, if I do it all the way down, it's, it's hard to talk. So when the baby is on the back, their chin should not be touching their chest because you're gonna block airways. You should make sure that you're regulating the temperature, that it's not too hot, it's not too cold, regulating the pose, making sure that the baby is good. Wow important and what about the must-haves uh for every newborn photographer i know you said at the beginning uh please don't buy stuff that you don't need but what do you consider is necessary to have to start you know i definitely need think you need good wraps you know i'm amazed when people don't have good stretchy wraps um you need them um I think, you know, I like diaper covers over the diaper because you don't want to have to spend silly time retouching a diaper. That's mm -hmm. just silly. So a lot of these outfits are 
sheer in nature. And so we have diaper covers that, you know, we sell in our store and that we use every day, every single day over the diaper and the diaper cover. Um, having, you know, outfits that fit and that are comfortable, having, you know, posing tools, you know, posing beans to make sure they're nice and firm. Um, I like using a bean bag. Some people like to use a table. I'm not a, a big fan of the table or things that may seem unsafe. I think that um, using bean bags or beds or things where, you know, the baby's a little bit safer. Um, and we don't really need much. Um, good wraps, a few outfits, good, good blankets, good posing beans. Backdrop. Um, backdrops. You want ones for the floor, ones for the wall. And then you want props that are not too big. You know, I visit a lot of studios and there's so many times I'll get there and they'll, they'll have these bowls that are huge that could just swallow a baby up. And I just feel like they're just too big. And so, you know, you don't want things that are too big. You don't want things that are too small, you know? So you got to really check your props and make sure that I mean, I see people, they have bowls like this big. I'm like, the baby's this big. Or, you know, buckets that are huge. And I'm like, oh my gosh, no, they're just too big. So, you know, the right size props, I think are very important. And what's in your camera bag? So my camera bag, very simple. It's one camera body, Canon 5D Mark IV, 24 to 70 USM, two lens. Yes. Usually two battery chargers and two batteries. Uh, you know, there was a time where I would always make sure I had a backup camera with me. If I was by myself, sometimes I'll have a backup body. If I think that there's, if I'm going to a place where I'm the only photographer and there's no one, no one else going to help me in any way, shape or form. Sometimes I'll just have a second body with me. I have two, I have two cameras. Um, uh, let's see, usually masks. Uh, sanitizer for the hands, usually lollipops for the kids. Always need good lollipops. Uh, mini first aid kit, always important. Uh, usually Aquaphor because I always find that either my hands are dry or I need, I'm like obsessed with moisturizing. Um, that's probably it. And what's your favorite beer? My favorite lens is the 24 to 70 USM2. Mm -hmm. And the reason is, is, you know, years ago when I started, I did, you know, 50, I've had 85, I've had 35, I've had 7200, you name the lens, I've had it. And what I found was the 24 to 70 USM2 is just a very solid, strong, sharp lens. I can get baby feet with it. I can get close up. I can get eyelashes. But it's so versatile because of the range. I can do family, I can do baby, sibling, I can run around on the beach. And so I really, that would be my go to lens. Mm -hmm. Years ago, when I would work in clients' homes, I would always make sure I had the Sigma 35 part with me because sometimes I would go to clients' homes and they wouldn't have enough light or I just wanted, you know, more light. So I would make sure that I had that lens with me. Uh, also in clients' homes, I would make sure I brought a diffuser with me. Super important to block natural light. And many times I'll bring that on vacation. Um, but yeah, I don't really use fixed lenses a whole lot. I do like the 1D Mark X for when I'm doing family and holidays and things like that. Awesome. And to close this uh, amazing interview, I know you uh, did an episode in one of your podcasts, but for the audience, what do you do when you are not taking photos? Yeah, I'm, I'm relaxing. I have three dogs, so I could be, you know, taking my dogs for a walk. I could be reading. I love to read. I love to watch documentaries. I love to nap in the sun. It's one of my favorite things to do. Uh, I like to work out on a trampoline. I actually have mini trampoline in my bedroom. And I just bought my daughter a 16-foot trampoline outside. Um, trampoline exercise is one of the best exercises you can do for your body. So I'm a big fan of that. Um, I love the beach. I love just, just relaxing. But I'm a crafter. So I have a crafting area in my home. So sometimes I'll just go if you I'm in my home, I have this whole dried floral area with a crafting table. And so 
sometimes I'll just sit and make headbands and craft or make wreaths. Um, I love to just experiment with different crafts. I'll go to the craft store with the kids and we'll make jewelry. You know, I'm a creative. So sometimes even when I'm relaxing, if, if I'm not doing anything for clients, I still may just do a fun little creative project or sometimes I'm just doing nothing at all and just relaxing. Thank you so much, Anna. I I had one of the best time uh, having this interview because I really wanted to know you for a long time. I admire your work. It is beautiful and everything that you do is you always blew me away with with your with your photos and with your videos and with your uh, social media tips and tricks about uh, newborn and maternity photography. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for inviting me. Well, and this is it for the for this episode. Thank you so much. Please, Anna, uh, remind us your socials and your website. I'm going to leave it anyways. But So on Instagram, you can just search my name, Anna Brand, with one N. Um, and Anna Brand Education, Anna Brand, Anna Brand Community. On YouTube, you can just go to Anna Brand Videos, my website. You can go to AnnaBrand.com, AnnaBrand.net. And there's links. If you go to my Instagram, I have links in my profile. That's find AnnaBrand.com and it has all my links. Thank you so much, Anna, and thank you, everybody, for listening and watching this episode. So I'll see you on the next one. Bye-bye.